What's up guys, Lucky Locks here, back with another prediction video, and LFA is back, ladies and gentlemen, with a stacked card this Friday, LFA 115. Can't wait to get into these ones, also can't wait to watch this event on Friday, because, like I said, they brought out the big guns for this one, lots of really good matchups, lots of really fun prospects to watch, and I have a feeling that a couple guys in this card we'll probably see in the UFC one day. So without further ado, let's get right into the action. Opening up the main card, we have Roland Dunlop and Raya Waller at 185 pounds. So Dunlop obviously is a sensational wrestler. That much we know about him. He was a 6-0 amateur. He is now 2-0 as a professional. And we just saw him get the slam KO victory on LFA in April. So the wrestling background checks out. He will be slightly bigger in this matchup, um, I believe. He was supposed to fight another great prospect in Joseph Holmes that fell out. That would have been a really tough test for Dunlop. I don't think this is near as tough of a matchup. And then, you know, he also was supposed to fight Bronco Busick here, who's a 2-2 two two guy. And Busick was brought in as food for... Bellator wrestler extraordinaire Jordan Newman and I think he was probably getting cast in the same role here just in a different movie and now Dunlop draws three and six opponent Raya Waller in this one he opened Dunlop I'm talking about opened at minus 500 he is now at minus 700 so pretty big favorite here and looking at Waller I mean he's three and six as a pro 39 years old, so we're not off to a great start there. Uh, I know what you're thinking, but I am going to make a small case for him. His last loss was Nishan Burrell in CFFC, who's pretty good. Another loss was Colin Huckbody, who's a 10-3 and fighter now. He is a guy who has won on Dana White's Contender Series and beat Ultimate Fighter contestant Aaron Phillips in CFFC. Uh, Waller also was a kickboxing win over Chris Kamotzi, so that's a pretty interesting... Uh, footnote there and maybe Waller is the more technical striker here but yeah I'm going with Dunlop I feel very confident that Dunlop gets the win here I probably won't touch that minus 700 maybe in like a super degen parlay but uh, yeah I really think he wins here he's a phenomenal wrestler much younger better athlete I mean I think almost everything favors him to win here so I will be going with Roland Dunlop to get it done in the first fight of the main card that's going to bring us to the featherweight division for a bout between Edwin Cooper Jr. and Andrew Johnson. Edwin Cooper Jr. is a credentialed wrestler, trains out of Jackson Wink, was supposed to fight Max Fuentes here. Um, Cooper is 4-1 with a 75% finish rate, 2-1 on LFA, won his last two fights. Nice win over Hobson Jr. last time out. He got a point deducted in the first round for shots to the back of the head. Basically was just able to have the fight down dominate from top position until he got the round two stoppage he's also really big for a 145 pounder at six foot one so definitely a big frame for the weight class andrew johnson comes in here on short notice he had a seven and one amateur career one loss via slam ko against jamie simmons who we've seen in the ufc uh in johnson started his pro career on the bellator prelims with a majority decision versus asif askar who's pretty decent won his next two fights a round three submission on ring of combat and won a decision on cffc haven't seen him in the cage since 2019 and he comes in on a few days notice here it's going to be difficult for him to deal with the wrestling attack of a much bigger and very athletic edwin cooper jr so I do like Cooper here. He has the size. He has the better experience, in my opinion. Great wrestling and probably more well-rounded and technically sound given that he's training at Jackson Wink. He opened at minus 180. I tried to slam that line, but it shifted really quickly. At minus 325, I'm no longer interested in betting it straight, but I would consider tossing him in a parlay closer to fight night maybe. But yeah, Edwin Cooper Jr. is going to be my pick here to get the job done. We have arrived at the strawweight division now for a bout between Catherine Paparaki and Hillary Rose. Paprocki will have a slight reach advantage. Everything else is virtually identical, including the age. Paprocki was 3-0 as an amateur. She is now 3-1 as a pro, with her lone loss on either level coming to Emily Ducote. Ducote is a legit fighter who used to be on Bellator, now on Invicta. Paprocki has a win over Isis Verbeek on Invicta, who is a Dutch kickboxer. Verbeek has gone on to win her next three outside of that promotion. And most recently, we saw Paprocki on LFA 108, where she picked up a round three submission. She was supposed to fight Vanessa Demopoulos. Demopoulos gets called to the UFC. So here we are now in this position. Um, that belt was scheduled for a few months ago, so I'm not saying that uh, that was supposed to be at this event, but that was supposed to be her last scheduled bout. Now we are at this bout. And uh, Paprocki likes to put her opponents under pressure. She's pretty decent standing. 
covers up pretty well defensively. She's strong in the clinch. She is willing to eat a few shots to get an entry, likes to get the fight down, has solid top control. Her last opponent, Vale, and uh, the fight against Verbeek shows that Paprocki's able to, you know, to hang in there with pretty good strikers. And that's pretty encouraging. Hillary Rose, 5-3 record as a pro, 5-3 record as an amateur, spent a lot of time on those Northeastern regional promotions, a lot of time on CES, has some fights on CFFC. Her losses came in her very first fight, then on Dana White's Contender Series against Cheyenne Bays, and in her most recent fight against Elise Reed in a title bout who we saw in the UFC not too long ago. So Hillary Rose has an 80% finish rate. She throws a bunch of one-twos. I don't think she's as good in the grappling as Paprocki. And Paprocki opened up as a plus 120 dog here. I think that would have been the spot to hammer the dog on this card. I don't think I'm going to touch Paprocki at minus 170. I just don't love that from a betting standpoint. Um, I'm also just a little salty. I missed the plus money. So that could be part of it. But I think Paprocki gets this one done. I think it'll be close. But I do like her to win this one. But there's going to be no action from me on this bout. Next up, we have a bout that I am very much looking forward to, and this is going to be at Bantamweight between Brian Bautista and Mondo Gutierrez. So Bautista was a 5-2 amateur. He is now a 4-1 pro. He has a 100% finish rate with four submissions. His lone loss comes on a Bellator prelim by heel hook. So he has won by submission or lost by submission in every single fight. Every single time it's ended by sub. He's never seen the scorecards, never seen round three. And Bautista likes to walk you down. He is good boxing. For a guy with so many submissions, I liked what I saw out of him standing. Good boxing, sharp combos, good head movement. Uh, really comfortable in the pocket, and he thrives there. He just does a good job defending on his feet as well. I like what I see from him in the stand-up. Mondo Gutierrez, on the other hand, looks like a really promising prospect. He's looked great so far. 7-0 amateur career, undefeated. 5-1 as a pro, and that one loss was to Mo Miller, who we just saw on Dana White's Contender Series, and he is very legit. And after not getting a contract in the UFC, we might see him on LFA again. Um... But yeah, Gutierrez also has a 100% finish rate. All of his wins are also by submission, and his one loss also comes by submission. So both of these fighters have only ever won or lost by submission. Neither of them have ever seen the third round. And I think the trends are trying to tell us something here, guys. I feel like this one might end by submission. Uh, I can definitely see Mondo getting a submission win in this one. Uh, yeah, Mondo Gutierrez has never been out of the first round in a win. His one loss was the only time he's seen the second round. He showed an insane amount of resilience in his last fight. Got dropped twice, had his back taken. A couple times I thought they might stop the fight, but he was able to fight his way back to the feet. He attempted a guillotine off a single leg shot from his opponent and ended up in top position. Started delivering some really good ground and pound. Eventually passes into half guard, uh, into mount, from half guard into mount, sorry. Gets the back, secures a rear naked choke with less than 10 seconds remaining in the first round, and then gets the submission. So Gutierrez just super tough, super strong on the ground. Uh, physically just very strong and a really yeah tough durable guy looks like a really solid prospect I'm going with Gutierrez to win this one I bet him at minus 200 as soon as the line dropped he's now around minus 260 I think that Bautista is going to be very competitive and potentially even slightly better on the feet but I think that Mondo is going to be able to work his ground game there are 11 fights between these two all 11 have ended inside the distance and by submission so if someone is going to get a sub here uh, sign me up for Mondo Gutierrez. That's going to be my pick in this fight. We move on to the lightweight division for a bout between Jake Kozorowski and Lucas Clay. Kozorowski is five years older than Clay, had a very successful 7-0 amateur career, has had a good run as a pro as well with a 5-1 record, won a split decision in his most recent fight in May, was the Pennsylvania cage fight champ as a pro and as an amateur. Training at Rufus Sport now, looks to be a pretty solid prospect, still looks a bit raw, some issues with the striking defense that worried me a little bit. Uh, he could have shored all that up by now, who knows. Lucas Clay, on the other hand, is 25 years old, still pretty young, long, lanky, good grappler, crafty fighter. Honestly, really like what I've seen from Clay thus far. 
was impressive in his last win on LFA over J.J. Okonovich. He is the only man to beat Brant Moore, a promising 9-1 prospect out of Texas. Clay is very impressive on the ground, very methodical passing guard and transitioning between positions. I think that this fight will be most competitive on the feet. On the ground, I just see Clay dominating him. So I think Clay gets this one done. He's currently a minus 600 favorite, so I won't be betting that. He opened around minus 400. I think that's a pretty decent line. I see Clay winning this one almost every time. Time. So I'm going to go with Lucas Clay to get this one done against Jake Kozarowski. That's going to bring us up to the co-main event of the card, and it is a heavyweight bout between Chad Johnson and Jordan Heiderman. Johnson is five years older than Heiderman. We last saw him on Dana White's Contender Series. He was stopped in the first round by Josh Parisian. So that's, you know, going to turn a lot of people off right off the bat. But uh, if you dig a little deeper, Chad Johnson, I actually think he's pretty good. Lengthy amateur career where he went 7-2. and two. There's a freakish amount of guys with 7 amateur wins on this card. I just want to point that out. There's been many people I've said that about so far. Um, and I just kind of noticed that when I was capping fights for this card. But anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, Johnson's pro career started with five straight wins. He's now gone one and two in his last three for his six and two pro record. He is one and zero on LFA. Has a hundred percent finish rate overall. Also has never been finished, or sorry, also has been finished in both of his losses. And Johnson has never been to the scorecards in his pro or amateur career. Seventeen fights. Not one time has it gone to decision. 17 fights, not one time has it ever even gone to round three. So Johnson is a bit of a KO or bust type of fighter, kill or be killed kind of guy. Pretty light for a heavyweight, weighed in at 215 pounds in his last fight. If that stays constant, Heiderman will have around 25 to 30 pounds on him in there. But Johnson normally comes in closer to 225, so I feel like we'll probably see him back around that weight here. He was able to control a big guy in Josh Parisian in the clinch. I don't know if Heiderman will be as easy. Johnson has a long reach of 80 inches though, and he will have an advantage there. He's actually a pretty decent striker and does throw a lot of volume. He had some big moments in the Parisian fight. Might have an advantage in that aspect of this fight, honestly. Uh, Jordan Heiderman is an undefeated LFA prospect who is 3-0 on the promotion and 4-0 overall. He had a successful, you guessed it, 7 wins as an amateur, 7-1 and one in his amateur career. Possesses a 75% finish rate as a pro. He is a big, powerful guy. Um, and I picked against him in his last fight. I felt like kind of the line was too wide, but he did show me some improvements and I am much more sold on him as a fighter at this point. The stand-up still scares me a little bit though, and I'll get to that. I think that Heiderman has a massive advantage in this one if he takes the fight down. If he has this big weight advantage coming in, I think it will be very difficult for Johnson to get up from bottom. It's just the stand-up that worries me in this one. I think Johnson is a much better striker, and I think that if this one stays standing, Johnson could you know, be very live to get a finish. I think that Heiderman needs to get takedowns, and if the fight hits the ground here, I think that Heiderman wins this one for sure. I don't think the takedowns will be as easy as they were against Anthony Garrett, but I still think he can get them, so I'm going to you know, lean towards Hotterman. I don't want anything to do with Hotterman at minus 350. I think I would rather bet Johnson by KO or even Johnson straight up at those odds. But I still favor Hotterman to win the fight. I see him more in the like minus 180 to minus 200 range than minus 350. But I do believe he definitely could look minus 350 if he's able to get takedowns consistently here. Because I don't think that Johnson is going to have very much going for him off his back here. So Hoderman will be the pick, but uh, I definitely could see some variance in this one. So just be, be a little bit careful with this fight would be my advice. And the main event of the night will be Josh Silviera and T Cummins for the light heavyweight belt. This should be an awesome fight. Josh Silviera, son of American top team coach Marcus MMA is in this guy's blood. We were supposed to see this fight in July. Silveira for the title, that is. It was supposed to be against Jesse Murray. He now has a new opponent in T. Cummins. So Silveira is a 5-0 pro with a 100% finish rate. Starter's career in Titan FC. Last three fights have been on LFA. He has four submissions, one knockout, was a 4-0 amateur, and is on a nine-fight win streak, including pro and amateur experience right now. Really solid in all areas. Excellent wrestler. He did that in college at Arizona State. A very capable grappler, as evidenced by his submission record. And pretty good stand-up as well. So Vera is definitely an exciting prospect, and I think if he wins this bout, uh, we will probably see him in the UFC at one point. 
Um, T. Cummins picked against him in his last LFA fight against an undefeated Hawaiian Muay Thai fighter in Anthony Kalani, and that was a big mistake. I thought the technical striking edge of Kalani would give him the advantage. Cummins showed that he's able to produce fight-changing sequences against guys on kind of the national regional level, and since then, he has another round one finish to his name. That was up at heavyweight, but both guys were kind of smaller. Cummins weighed in at around 214 pounds for that fight. His opponent was like 225. So Cummins is 4-0 pro in MMA, a 2-0 pro in bare-knuckle boxing. He had a 5-3 amateur career, and he's really starting to iron out the kinks in his game now. Um, I actually really like T. Cummins. I think that he's a very good fighter. He has a style that's really effective early in fights. He's a great athlete, really explosive guy, hits really hard, has powerful takedowns. Um, yeah, T. Cummins has impressed me lately. I think he's a good fighter. But Silveira is going to be by far, I think, the toughest fight of his career. Um... So I'm probably going to go go with Silvier in this one. I mean, I really like T. Cummins, but he's been given probably the best 205-pounder currently in the LFA right now. With that said, Cummins is live. I won't be laying minus 325 straight on Silvier. This fight opened at minus 225 for Silvier. I wasn't quick enough to get that line, so I'm just going to pass on the fight. There could be some value on Silvier inside the distance. Five rounds to work for that submission, so maybe Silvier by sub as well. I think the line will continue to move in his direction. If it gets really crazy by fight night, there could be a big number on T. Cummins by knockout, which I think is pretty much the only way I see him winning this fight. I think someone gets finished for sure here. Um, Prediction-wise, I'm going to go with Josh Silveira to win the light heavyweight title in the LFA. And that's going to do it for my LFA predictions, guys, for this event on Friday, LFA 115. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate everyone who has subscribed, comments, likes, all that good stuff. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Hope you all have a great day. Best of luck on Friday, and I'll catch you on the next one.